just a few reminders, inshallah ta'ala, just some things that we sort of experience uh, in the community. But we should remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says in the Quran, وَلَا تَسْمَعُونَ مِنَ الَّذِينَ وَتُبْتَعُ مِنْ قَبْرِكُمْ مِنَ الَّذِينَ أَشْرَكُوا أَمَنْ كَثِيرًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says that indeed, indeed, and there's a double emphasis, لَمْ تُكِيدْ مُنَ تُكِيدْ أَفْتَقِيدْ for people that study grammar. Indeed, indeed, you're going to hear much from the people of the book, meaning Jews and Christians, and also from those who associate partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and then kathira, much that will grieve you, that's going to annoy you. This is something that's expected, right? This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying in the Quran. This is a medani ayah. This is expected. The dogs will always bark. But then he says, subhanahu wa ta'ala, in tasbiru wa tattaku. But if you have sabr, if you have patience, what is patience? In a sabr fi sadmatul ula. As the Prophet sallallahu he said, when he saw a woman crying in the graveyard and she was being a little excessive in her weeping, right? And he said, Ya Allah, O maid servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, wa spiri wa taqi, have patience and have taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And she, without even turning around to see who it was, she said, You've never been afflicted like this. What do you know? You've never been afflicted like this. The Prophet sallallahu he buried six of his seven children. Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Ashad al-bala and al-anbiya. The most severe of tribulations. Ibtila al-bala. They come to al-anbiya, the prophets. Right? To raise their degrees. So he said to her, patience is, true patience is at the first strike of the disaster. That's sabr. Right? So I remember one time I was in Iran, and there was a car accident, and this guy got out, he said, hey, Baba! And then they started wrestling on the ground, they're punching each other, after like two minutes, they're both exhausted, they said, ah, you know, I'm sorry, maybe I made a wrong turn, please forgive me. I was like, it's already done, that's not patience. Patience is when the first fight comes to you, and you show patience. Right? And the ulama say, fake it till you make it. Right? You have to have takhalluf. Takhalluf. Takhalluf is to pretend, pretension. Pretend to be patient if you can't be patient. And if you do it over time, then it becomes part of your adat. It becomes part of your habitus. Right? It's woven into the fabric of who you are inherently. Right? So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, be patient. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, in tasbiru. When you hear all of this garbage like Imam Zayd was talking about, there's people on TV, these anti-Muslim, pseudo-intellectual, evangelical profligates. This guy, Pat Robertson, he's infamous, actually ran for president in 1984. Allah had mercy on America. This man did not become president, although we got Reagan, but we won't talk about that. Anyway, this man says, almost every single time I turn on his show, he's talking about Islam. He's probably doing it all the time, right? Out of the five, four or five times I turn on his program, he's talking about, he says, Allah is the moon god. Allah? Allah is the moon god. So who's Allah? First, I didn't understand. Allah. He's always talking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay. Allah is the moon god. And, you know, his, his little uh, group around him said, How do you know that? And he said, You ever seen the flag of Pakistan? You ever seen the flag of Pakistan? He said, what? what's, what's wrong with the flag of Pakistan? There's a moon. There's a moon on it. And they also use a lunar calendar. This is his Dalil, that we worship the God of the Hamar, the moon God, right? So, uh, you know, Jews, they have a lunar calendar, right? Christians, they have a solar calendar. They worship on Sunday. Oh, they worship the sun God. Is, it, is that a good Dalil? No, it's not. So, have patience and have taqwa. What is taqwa? Taqwa is hard to translate. Imam Zayd said that the objective of Ramadan is to grow in taqwa in order that you have taqwa. And the ulama say that the sharaf or the fadl of something is known by its gharaf. That the, uh, the merit of something is known by its objective. What is the objective of fasting? In order for us to have taqwa. And taqwa is two parts. There's mushahada and muraqaba for the note takers. Mushahada means that you're fully cognizant that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is indeed watching us. Some people find this very intrusive, like atheists. I don't want a celestial North Korea, is what they said. 
I don't watch Kim Jong Il watching my every move. Why do they say that? Right? They say that because they don't know Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. If they knew Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, then they would automatically love Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. You have help but to love Him. If you had ma'rifah of Him, you would have mahabba of Him. Right? So, uh, where's it going with this? Uh, mushahada. Right? So, what is mushahada? Like, pretend you get in your car and you're driving down the street and a cop comes behind you. Right? You know the cop was watching you. You know that. The cop is in of it. Definitely, he sees me. I'm right in front of him. Right? That's called mushahada. And then what do you do? You check your speedometer a little bit. Make sure you turn on the blinkers. You tell your kid in the back seat, are you buckled? Put it on. No! All right, check the mirrors. You stop at full stop at the red light. If you're going to make a right turn, full stop. You can stop a little bit longer. All right? This is called Murahaba. You're vigilant over yourself. This is taqwa. All right? With Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you have patience, we have taqwa. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, in Surah Al-Ma'idah, he says, قُلْ لَا يَسْتُوا الْخَبِيثِ وَالْطَيِّبِ Say, they are not the same. Khabith, dirty things, foul things, and good things. They're not the same. لَا يَسْتُوا They're not the same. وَلَوْ أَعْجَبَكَ كَثْرَةُ الْخَبِيثِ Even if the sheer amount of the garbage surprises you or dazzles you, it's just garbage. Where there's a little bit of garbage, or a lot of garbage, guess what? It's garbage. You can't do anything with it. So we have the youth, the Shabbat, and other people too. Muslim adults. They go Google the name of the Prophet and page after page after page of Chabayit after Chabayit, garbage after garbage. And this has a, a real detrimental effect when you read these types of things. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, don't be deluded by that. Fatakullah, the next part of this ayah says, fear Allah. Have taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mushahada muraqaba. Fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ya ulil albab. Oh people of lub. What is the lub? Is the kernel, the seed of something. People of core understanding. People who have tasted their faith. The people of dhuq and tahqiq. Who know how to look at something by its outward form and draw out the ma'ana. The real meaning of that outward form. These are people that are guided by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This comes through hidayah. Or it comes through the rational faculty if you know how to use it, the aqal. Right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, don't let all of this garbage dazzle you, even if it is a lot. Be people of discernment. Be people of discernment. And this is very, very important. To be able to look at reality and to draw out the meanings of what's actually happening. And Muslims, they fall into these kind of uh, these bifurcations because they're, they're influenced by Christianity. We don't even know it. All of us have been influenced by Christianity. Western, postmodern Protestantism is very dualistic. It's very simplistic. Right? Basically, you know, the prosperity gospel, that the amount of love that God has for you is commensurate with the amount of money in your bank account. So if you have a lot of money, you have some investment homes, you got a Rolls Royce, obviously Allah loves you, but these people are Allah hates them. This is, this is the prosperity gospel. Right? Manifest destiny. We're influenced by these types of things. I hear some ajib and ghanim types of things from Muslims sometimes. You know, for a lot of Muslims, the Golden Gate Bridge is the definitive proof that Christianity is correct and Islam is false. Now you think to yourself, what on earth? What does the Golden Gate Bridge have to do with what is what are you talking about? You say, no, it's a Christian country, that's that's problematic. This, this country was founded explicitly to be the antithesis of Christian Europe, to be the opposite of what was happening, especially in Church of England uh, with King George, the Anglican Church, separation of church and state. This country was in no way founded as a Christian nation. The Treaty of Tripoli, 1787, ratified into law by John Adams. You can look this up. Right? But, they say, but they say, it's a Christian country. And so the Golden Gate Bridge, this is to fit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Therefore, Christianity is right in Islam is false. Because you go to Muslim countries, you'll find bridges where if the termites stop holding hands, they're going to collapse. This is a simplistic worldview. A lot of Muslims fall into this worldview. Right? They say, why does why does Shaitan have so much power? Right? Shaitan is a jinn. They, they, because again, influenced by Hellenized, Pauline, 
Christianity, there's a dualism, there's a bifurcation, Allah on one side, Satan on the other side, almost like they're equal, they fight battles, Satan wins one, Allah wins another one, Satan wins another one, no, no, no. He is for you a rival, not for Allah. Allah doesn't have a rival or an opposite. Subhanahu, Allah is above such things. Satan, Shaitan doesn't have power over you. If you let him, he does. But he makes what's what's up. Nothing has power over Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to snap his fingers, as it were, in no anthropomorphic way, and destroy all of the cosmos, no one is going to ask him, Why did you do that? Nobody is going to ask him this question. They cannot ask him this question. Allah does whatever he wills. A lot of the youth, they fall into this religion called Thalema. Have you heard of this? Thalema. It's a Greek word from the New Testament. Basically, the founder of this religion was a man named Alistair Crowley. He founded the Church of Satan in England. He has two books. These are their sacred scriptures. One is called Magic in Theory and Practice, in which he says very clearly, the best way to get power from evil demons is to kill little babies. That's why during Halloween, there's a lot of abductions. This happens in America. A lot of children go missing during Halloween in this country. What happens to these children? Allah have mercy on us. Allah preserve us. That's what Allah and was said up. There's crazy people out there. They worship Satan. Another one of his books is called the Liber Legis, the book of the law. And in this book he says, our only law is, do what thou wilt. Do whatever you want. This is our law. Do whatever you want. Who's the only one that can truly say that? In Allah, I do not you Allah does what He wants. When you say, I do whatever I want, that means you're making yourself God. Right? This is a form of shirk. No, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does whatever He wants. The Prophet said, In lam tastahi, ida lam tastahi, fasna'na shi'ta, o kama qala alayhi salatu wa salam. He said, If you don't have any shame, then do what you want. Do what thou wilt. That doesn't mean, okay, I don't have shame. I can do whatever I want. No, he's saying you should have shame. Don't do whatever you want. A lot of youth are falling into this, this trap. So, we don't let these things bother us. People attack the Prophet so long, you send them. You know, obviously, it gets our emotions going. We hate this type of thing. But we have to be people of taqwa and people of patience and actualize this type of patience. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he's got his hadith back. The hadith has backing. Major backing. The biggest backing, so to speak. There's a hadith in Bukhari on the authority of Abdullah ibn, uh, Abdullah ibn Abbas, which he says a Christian man in Medina became Muslim. And then this Christian man, for whatever reason, and he was a scribe of the revelation. He used to write down the Quran that was revealed to the Prophet. So Allah so then this Christian man, he, uh, he reverted back to Christianity. And it's very strange. This happens all the time. I don't know if you're aware of this. I deal with this because I'm into this Christian Muslim type of thing. I'm doing doctoral work on this. I've been involved in this for a number of years. And I talked to several of these people who were Muslim and became Christian. And I'll tell you this. Every single time, without exception, every single one of these people had what I would say at least a major misapprehension as to what Islam actually was. Some of them, I doubt they were even Muslim to begin with. So they don't know what they've rejected. Because some of, some of these people, some of the Muslims, I don't know, we don't study, we don't study things anymore. So the religion is sort of focus, focus, jinn stories, ghost stories, that Kappa John, or Apple John, or Chacha John, they taught us when we were little bit, when little kids, the jinn stories. This is Scooby Doo religion, right? Like this one brother, he said, you know, I, uh, I, I last night there was a black dog in my room, and it had green eyes, and it was exactly three a.m. It bit me on the hand, but when I looked, there was nothing there. What does it mean? I said, you know what it means? You, you stop hitting the pipe. <laughs> That's what that means. Put the hookah down, bro. Put it down, relax, pick up the mushaf, raise your arms and dua, pick up the shamay, the nabawiyah, read some, something about Aqidah, read the sirah of the Prophet What are you doing all day? Smoking the hookah? Putting pictures of yourself smoking a pipe on Facebook? And then you're seeing the dog and the green eyes? And 
What do you want me to know? The dark represents the nafs and it's a jinn. And the green eyes is because you love money. And then it's 3 a.m. because it's a trinity. And what are you talking about, bro? Put the hookah down, relax, and study the deen. This isn't some Scooby Doo religion. We go to the mystery man, you smoke the hookah, then you look for gyms, and you have a talking dog, and then you eat some Scooby Snacks. And it's serious religion. It's serious religion. So, anyway, this man, he became Christian after he became Muslim. Right? And then he said to his Christian friends, he said, La yadri Muhammadun. He says, the Prophet he doesn't know anything except what I have written for him. Right? A few days later, this man dies of natural causes. He died. The Christians buried him. And the day after that, they found his body was laying on top of the earth. And they said, ah, Muhammad and his Sahaba, what would they done? And the Prophet says, no, had nothing to do with that. No companion exhumed his body. So they buried him a little bit deeper. A little bit deeper. The next day, they found his body laying on top, his carcass laying on top of the earth. They said, ah, Muhammad and his companions, these guys, yeah, what have they done to our brother? Right? And then they buried him in like this pit. Right? It's like, nail it up, put him in a pit. The next day they come, his body laying on top of the earth. They said, leave it. You know what happens to a body when you leave it on top of the earth? This is a man who was spewed out by the earth, as it were. Spewed out, vomited. By an auto, spewed him out. Get out of here, spit him out. Why? Because if he denigrated one little denigration, insult against the Prophet Allah's got his hadith back. Major backing. Like in Mecca, the Prophet Wasallam. When he received the revelation, so tell your Ashira, the ones that are close to you. So he climbed a Safa and he told the people, he said, And this means, this is a battle cry of the Quraysh. Sabaha is related to Sufi. Right? This is what they would say if there's a raid coming into the city, a raid, an army coming in to raid a village and plunder. Right? Why is it related to the Sufi? Because raids usually happen during the daytime. They don't happen at night. This is pre-Islamic rules of engagement. You don't attack people at night when they're sleeping. You look at what's going on now, you have drones dropping bombs on women and children. You know, from civilized, quote-unquote, civilized military industrial complexes. Anyway, so, uh, what was they saying? Sorry. What was the story? Ah, so you trust that. Sorry, it's getting old, I think. So then he says to the people, he says, if I saw an army approaching the city on this other side, would you believe me? And they say, of course, you're a Sadiq al Amin. You are a Sadiq al Amin. This is the title they gave him. He said, I am a warner to you. So first he warns them. Because according to Usul, there's an axiom that first you save the people from harm before you give them the benefit. So first he's a nadir, he warns them, and there's a silence. And then Abdul Uzza, his uncle, he says, Ali Hada, this is why you call this out, Tabalek. May you perish. And Tabalek, in colloquial Arabic, is an F bomb. He dropped an F bomb on the Prophet. You know, so, you know, people, this is his public, this is his uncle, right? There's people around, people drop F-bombs on us, what do we do? I saw his brother one time driving in a car, leaving the masjid. Somebody cut him off. Spoon, 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 spoon. Oh, stop, blow up. Drop like six, seven F-bombs. I'm sitting in the car next to him. So I'm sorry, brother, this man just... Cut me off. It's okay. It is, it is hot. Yeah, there's actually a khilaf amongst the it's khilaf amongst the ulama about using your horn. Some of them say it's haram to actually use your horn. Haram. Some of the ulama, contemporary ulama, they say because you're preaching adab, you're scaring people. Relax. No, you can only use it for ten bid. Just you know, if somebody stopped at a red light for texting or something. Don't be like, ah, what are you doing? Tell you, fubu, fubu, right? So this is Abu Lahab, right? Abdul Urza is Abu Lahab. 
So this is what he did. And Abu Lahab used to walk, used to walk behind the Prophet Sallallahu and throw stones at him. So he used to put hands on the Prophet Sallallahu So what does Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala say? Tabat yada Abi Lahab in Mecca. Tabat yada Abi Lahab in Mecca. Perish. Make memory. He said Perish the hands of Abu Lahab. What tabat at the end? This tabat at the end is not necessary. You get the point across. What is the point of what tabat at the end? What is the point of this? Uh, repeat is that Abu Lahab is done. It's over. As the mafia used to say, forget about it. Abu Lahab, forget about it. He's done. Why? Because he denigrate and insult the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has got the Prophet's back. There's another story, and this is leading up to what I really want to talk about is a surah in the Quran, Surah 108, which is called Al-Kawtha. A beautiful surah. Early Meccan surah. So there's a few surah in the Quran, a few chapters in the Quran that are called the chapters of consolation. will console his habib. Like, Ruha, Alam Nishrah, Alam Nishrah, And then its culmination is Al-Kawtha. So the background of the surah is that a man named Al-As ibn Wa'il, Al-As ibn Wa'il, because the Prophet's sons had died in infancy. al qasim and Abdullah died when they were very young. So this man, al as ibn Wa'il, he said, إِنَّهُ أَقْتَرْ أَوْ هَذَا أَقْتَرْ أَقْتَرْ means he's been cut off. Batara means to cut off the tail of a horse. What does that mean? He doesn't have any sons. His lineage has been cut off. And this is how he used to refer to the Prophet as Allah right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals, إِنَّا أَعْقَيْنَاكَ الْكَوْفَ Beautiful surah. A lot of things happen in, in the Arabic. It's interesting, Imam Fakhr al-Din al-Razi, who wrote the beautiful tafsir, tafsir al-Kabir, also known as Mafati al ghayb And people who speak Farsi, you have to know Fakhr al-Din al-Razi. You cannot see the very Fakhr al-Din al-Razi. Even if you don't speak Farsi, this is one of the great uh, tafsir of our tradition. He has a section in his tafsir called Al-Munasabat. And Munasabat really deals with uh, the significance of the ordering of the surah, of the, of the chapters in the Quran, right? So the surah itself is a literary unit and it's cohesive because, you know, the classical orientalists who basically have a bachelor's degree, the equivalent of a bachelor's degree in Arabic, he looks at, he reads the Quran within the surah and he says, this doesn't make sense, this changing of tense, what's going on here? Right, first person, third person, singular to plural, this verse has nothing to do with this verse, and then it goes back to another. This is a jumbled mess. But scholars today, like uh, Karl Ernst, who wrote the book How to Read the Quran, obviously is a lot of what he says is very problematic. But he admits, yes, the surah is a literary unit. But it's not just the surah itself, but the ordering of the surah. Right? So not only is there inter surah uh, cohesiveness, but intra surah cohesiveness. So he says here, it's interesting. If you look at the surah before, Al Ma'un, Araitan that you can't be good deen, for that you can't let you do early your team, while that you prove to Allah to hide in the scheme. Have you seen the one who denies faith uh, and the one who rebuffs the yatim, the orphan, and doesn't even encourage? The feeding of the poor person. Have you seen that one? So what is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talking about here? What is he condemning? He's condemning bukhulhul. Bukhulhul. Right? To be stingy. To be a cheapskate. The bakhil. Right? The Prophet said, the real bakhil is the one, when my name is mentioned, he doesn't send salawat on me. Because it's so easy. Just say salawat on me. This is a true bakhil. Another, the Arabs also use the word bakhil for the one who's constipated. Right? Because... If you just let go of what's what's in his body, it would actually benefit him. But he's all let it go. Right? Give your wealth, it benefits you. So he's talking about bukhul here. And then in Surah al kawfar inna a'atayna. So i'ata means to give. Bukhul and i'ata. These are opposites. These are in contrast. These are in contrast. And then he says, فَوَيْلٌ لِلْمُصَلِينَ أَلَّذِينَ هُمْ عَنْ صَلَاتِهِمْ سَاءُمْ well, to the worshippers who are neglectful of their prayers. Sahun, neglectful of their prayers. And this is contrasted with Surah Al-Kawthar. Fasadli, 
Pray. Fear and amal. Imperative. Pray. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Alladinhum yura'un in al Those who pray with riya. What is riya? Ostentation. People who pray to show off. Right? Like you go into the masjid, you say, I'm going to do a quick salat al maghrib and then I'm going to go. So you start your prayer, and then a brother comes in that you want to impress. And in your mind, you thought to yourself, I'm going to do uh, al asr and al ikhlas And then the brother comes in, and you start going, Alif Lami. And Khawiyani, MashaAllah, Tilawa, Tawila. This is Riyah. This is ostentation. So this is contrasted with Fasalli li Rabbika. Pray to your Lord exclusively. Ikhlas. Riyah and Ikhlas. And then he says, Wa yamna'un al ma'un. And those who prevent even little small neighborly things. They don't give even to their neighbor something small. And this is contrasted with Al-Kawthar, Wal-Nahar, Nahar, and sacrifice. Sacrifice, you sacrifice animals, right? What do you do? You give some of the meat to your neighbors, right? The Prophet Sallallahu said, إِذَا تَبَقْتَ مَرَقَةً فَأَكْثِرْ مَعَهَا وَتَعَهَدْ يَعَنَكَ أَوْ كَمَا قَالَ When you cook uh, soup, increase its water, and be mindful of your neighbors, increase the water of the soup. So this is Something that Fakhradina Razi mentions in his tafsir, this type of munasabah between the surahs. Anyway, so now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins, inna, right, which is inna, this called hafra turki, the emphatic particle, right, and nahnu, the independent personal pronoun. So, verily we, indeed we, or no doubt we, a'atayna'ka. A'atayna is past tense. This is called fi'l maldi, past tense, or perfect tense. What does perfect tense mean? The action has been perfectly completed. It's done. Why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala use a past tense? When the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa is living in Mecca, this is an early Meccan surah. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is azadi and abadi. He has a pre and post eternality. So time doesn't make a difference to him. He's not in time. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. The other ulama, they say, that's true, but also the fact that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, when he speaks about things that relate to al akhirah he uses the past tense to guarantee that they're going to happen. To guarantee they're going to happen. Right? For example, when the Masru tells me, uh, he says, Ali, and I say, the baby, he says, go get me some coffee. And I say, consider it done. Right? It's done. Did I do anything yet? I'm still sitting in my chair. But I have a, I have an intention. It's a guarantee. You can take it to the bank and cash it. I'm going to bring you some coffee. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he speaks about al akhirah say, this is already done for you. This is a consolation to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It's already done. Consider it done. This is a fair amount of the significance of the past tense verb. Another thing the ulama point out here is, why does Allah say a'ta and not a'ta or wahaba? There's different ways of saying to give in Arabic. To give something, different ways of saying. What are the difference? A'ta in Arabic, which is a causative form. This also, a'ta is also causative for people who study grammar. A'ta means you give something to someone, but that person has to do something with what you gave them. And if they don't do it, you can take it back. So there's strings attached. That's ata with alif bar. Ata with atayna with atayna Musa kitaba. We gave Musa the book. Ata meaning that Musa Isa, he has to do something with the book. He has a responsibility now. He can't just you know kick back all things with the book. Allah is not going to Got to do something. Got to teach the book now. You got to teach, explicate, make bayan of the book. Right? This is ata. So Allah doesn't use this word. There's also wahaba. Wahaba means to give to something to someone as a gift, whether that person deserves it or not. Whether that person deserves it, whether there's a reason or not, Allah will give to someone. Right? Don't let our hearts deviate after you have guided us and gift bestow upon us. This is fi'r dua. We don't say fi'r amr. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
We can't give Allah Rahman. It's fear and dua. Right? Lana, bestow upon us from your mercy, a portion of your mercy. You are the one that gives it. Right? But this is not the verb that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses in Al Kawfa. He says, A'qa. What does I'qa mean? It means to give to someone because that person deserves it. That person has merit. That person is meritorious. He has something good about that person. There's an illa. Right? There's something good about that person. And when this verb is used and it's given to someone, and this verb is used, it can never be taken back. There are no strings attached, and he can do whatever he wants with it. It's never taken back. There are no strings attached, and he can do whatever he wants with it. This is the verb Aqa. So what is the merit that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about here? What is the fadail of the Prophet sallallahu Inna a'atayna ka. Why? He doesn't mention because you you are the amana, you have sit, you have sharaf. Allah doesn't mention these things. So the ulama say, kulluhu bila taqsis. All of the Prophet, everything about him is meritorious. In other words, Allah is saying, Indeed, we have already given it to you because of who you are, O Muhammad. It's just because of who you are. Because of you. Because you are you. This is why we have given it to you. Just because you are you. Right? And this is how he's described actually in the Old Testament. The Prophet ﷺ is clearly prophesied in the books of Ahl al-Kitab. But you know, people don't study these things anymore. Not even their own ulama. Perfect description of them given in Shira Hashri. It says, uh, in the Arabic, that's the Hebrew, the, the, the Arabic says, فَمَهُ عَذْبٌ His mouth is sweet. The Hebrew says, فَكُلُّ مُحَمَّدٍ All of him is Muhammad. All of him. كُلُّهُ مُحَمَّدٍ What does that mean? This is elliptical. This is poetry. Poetry is not, is very uh, good poetry. It's not direct. It's elliptical. It wants, to, it wants you to think about something. All of him is Muhammad. Everything. It's not just his name. Everything about him is praiseworthy. So inna a'atayna kal kawthar We have given you kawthar Al kawthar What is kawthar? This is from kathura Right? Which means to increase something Kawthar is called sifatul mubalaha This is an intensive form Kawthar Like kathir You heard of kathir Ibn kathir Right? But the wow Is stronger than the ya Kawtha is stronger than Kathir. The wow is stronger than the Ya. Right? What does it mean, Kawtha? So all of the ulama say, this is Nahrun fil Jannah. This is a river in paradise. But most of the ulama say, it means other things as well. Nabuwa and Quran and Shafa'a, Ahlin Bayt, Fatima Zahra, alayhi salam, and other things as well. The fact that Allah says, What does this mean? Allah has exalted the remembrance of the Prophet. According to Imam Suyuti, he says, Ja'ala ismuhu sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, maqruna bi ismihi. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put the name of the Prophet next to his name. Muhammadur Rasulullah. Wa'ati'ullah wa rasul. This happens over and over in the Quran. Right? Kawthara. So, remember what Al Asif Duwadin said to the Prophet? He said, In Abu Abtar, he's been cut off. He has no sons. He has no lineage. Right? So, this is from the Fususiyah, this is from this, the special properties of the Prophet. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he gave Ahlul Bayt through his daughter Fatima, alayhi salam, and Ali. And look at the Ahlul Bayt. And we love the Ahlul Bayt. We love the Ahlul Bayt because we're commanded to love Ahlul Bayt. The Prophet sallallahu he said, Fatima to bid'atun min me. Fatima is a piece of my flesh. Whoever makes her angry makes me angry. Whoever makes me angry makes Allah angry. Every lineage is cut off on the Day of Judgment except my lineage and those who are connected to me either through marriage or some other way. <coughs> Imam al awzai he says something interesting. Imam al awzai was a great mujtahid whose school kind of was swallowed 
uh, by the school of Imam Shafi'i and the school of Abu Hanifa. But he had a school at one point. Great Imam Mujtahid in Mutlaq. He mentions a tradition of the daughter of Usama bin Zayd. Who is Usama bin Zayd? Usama bin Zayd was a great companion of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He was 15 or 16 or 17 years old when the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam returned to the mercy of his Lord, subhanahu wa taala. He is the son of Zayd ibn Hakifa, who is called Hibbur Rasulullah, the beloved of the Messenger of Allah. At one point, he was called Zayd ibn Muhammad, the son of the Prophet, the adopted son of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. One time the Prophet sallallahu he took Zayd, Usama bin Zayd, and he put him on one of his knees. They were children, and he took Hassan ibn Ali, and he put him on his other knee, and he said, Allah love them because I love them. So the daughter of Usama bin Zayd, his daughter, and her mawla, her freed slave, they go to the caliph, Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. They go to the caliph. Right? And the caliph, when he saw them, he began following them around like a servant waiting on them hand and foot. The caliph. And then he offered his seat to her. He sat on the ground in front of her. And then he started touching the clothes of the freed slave of the daughter of a companion of the prophet. He started touching his clothes like this. The caliph, why is he doing this? What's he doing? Because he wants that, that connection somehow. Some connection. With the Prophet sallallahu Even Umar used to go into the masjid, touch the minbar of the Prophet, and wipe it over his face. We don't read these things anymore. Even Umar is a companion. No one knows the Atika better than the Sahaba. Nobody knows it. Don't tell me that as an American in 2013, as a postmodern society, some of these Sahaba, yeah, they don't know what they're doing. Stop it, Allah. Khayrul nas qarni. The best people is my generation. Some connection with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa so Kothar, we have given you Kothar, right? And this is the opposite of Abtar. Fasalli biradika. So pray to your Lord. Imperative. Pray to your Rabbah. It's interesting, Allah uses Rabbah. What is the difference between the word Allah and Rabbah? The ulama say here, the exegesis of the Quran say, when Allah is used, lafun jalala, the exalted expression is used, this denotes Allah's utter transcendence. Is Jalal, right? When Rabb is used, this is more personal. His imminence, right? His Maria, that he's close. He is Qurb, he is close to us. So you know what is really interesting? When the Prophet said that, uh, during his Sirah, when he's in a time where he's afraid of something, Allah will reveal, reveal a Surah to him or a verse to him and use the word Rabb. Like when he was in the cave. On Laylatul Qadr, Iqra Bismi Rabbika Alladhi Khalaq. Not Iqra Bismillah. If you hear the word Allah, it's too majestic. So read in the name of your Lord, meaning there's Inaya. I'm taking care of you, relax. You're in our fortress, you're in our eye, so to speak. Right? Inaya, Mahabba. We love you, we are your Lord, we're taking care of you. This is the consolation to the Prophet. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and sacrifice for your Lord. Very interesting. And Asa ibn Wa'i who denigrated the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. There's, you know, the, the, the last verse says, indeed, your hater, your hater, he's cut off. And there's a few ways to say hater. There's Abu. Right? We use this with the shaitan. Adu means a rival or an arch enemy, a foe, right? So who's the rival of Spider-Man? I don't know. That, that lizard guy. Sorry. Batman. Batman against the Joker. Right? Those are rival. Arch nemesis, if that's the plural of nemesis. Is it? Nemesis, nemesis. Whatever. Right? So, what is it, Adu? It's someone that's trying to hurt you, but they may not necessarily hate you. They may not necessarily hate you. Like, there are a lot of Christian scholars, like John of Damascene, who write a refutation of the Nabuwa of the Prophet because he's trying to discredit the Prophet but he's not anything against the Prophet he just thinks that he's misguided, and he's, you know, the, the rival of people becoming Christian. Right? This is an Adu. And then another level is a a mubhid, comes from the word, word. Right? This is an enemy 
who hates you, and he's trying to hurt you. He hates you, and he's trying to hurt you because he hates you. Right? Amr ibn al-As, for example, he said, I hated the Prophet Wasallam so much at one point that I went out in many Ghazawah, many military expeditions to kill him. I hated him so much. He had both. And then there came a time when I loved the Prophet Wasallam so much, I couldn't even look in his eyes. I couldn't raise my head to look at him squarely in his face because I was overawed by him. And if he's telling his son Abdullah on his deathbed, if you ask me right now, what does the Prophet look like? I don't even remember because I never looked at him. I was so embarrassed that I fought against him so much when I became Muslim, I would just sort of look down and. Right? Who is Amr ibn al As? Who is his father? Al As ibn Wahim. <laughs> Very interesting. The same man who said to the Prophet had an uptime. He's cut off. His own son, his own son loved the Prophet more than his own father. His own son would give his life for the Prophet over his own father. And then there's a Shani on another type of enemy. This is the worst type of enemy. A Shani. This is someone who he hates you, he's trying to hurt you. And he actually de derives some sort of sadistic pleasure when bad things happen to you. It actually gives him pleasure. It's a sick mentality, right? People, you know, they write these things about the Prophet Sallallahu and it causes an uproar in the Muslim Ummah. They actually, they like that. It, it, it tickles their fancy. People are strange. People say, I think, in the Shani this person hates you, he's trying to hurt you, and he derives pleasure. This one is cut off. Right? So, my message of consolation to everyone that I'm out of time is that this affair is real. Allah is God. The Prophet is a messenger of God. There's a Jannah, there's a garden, there's a Nag, there's hellfire. These things are real. The Prophet is truthful, he gave us the message. And we should have yaqeen in this, and we increase in our yaqeen when we have knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't make this into the Scooby-Doo religion. Forgive. No more Scooby-Doo religion. We have to be serious. I, I used a little bit of grammar today to show you that there's a lot to study. It's not just, yeah, I read this translation and whatever, it doesn't make sense to me. The companion to the elephant, what is that? Who cares? These things have significance. These things are deep. These things require analysis. It's either one of two things. Either this religion is so simplistic, anyone can do it. Or, it's too hard, I can't do it. Like we have Arabic classes. Right? I've, I've, I've started 10 or 11 Arabic classes. Because it was just allowed to die. Because people say, it's too hard. One of my teachers, he was teaching Arabic. And a student came up to him and he said, it's too hard, I can't do it. So he asked the student, he said, uh, where did you go to school? He said, uh, I have a master's from Stanford. He says, SubhanAllah, I went to a JC, and I can do this. Why do we tell ourselves, that you're a genius, this should be very easy for you. You're telling ourselves this is too hard. Or it's too easy, a monkey can do it. Right? So we don't, we don't honor the deen, we don't honor the knowledge. We don't want to out of time to show it to Allah. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Muhammadin wa alayhi wa sallam. الحمد لله رب العالمين